What's up guys? Today I'm back in the shop and I'm working on the new rear axle for my Colorado. I uh, just picked this up to replace the Ford 9 inch that I'm currently running that has had two lockers fail in the last two years. So I decided to upgrade to a little bit bigger axle and I just wanted to show you all what I chose and some things I'm going to do to it to get it ready. Um, there's some research that I've been doing and some parts I found that should hopefully make this a pretty tough axle for pretty low budget. So let's get started. So this is a Ford 10 and a quarter. Most people call this a Sterling 10 and a quarter. This one specifically is out of a 97 F250. Uh, they came in F250s and F350s all the way back to, I think, 1985. And then they are still using them today, but they're a little bit different. So this one is eight lug, eight on six and a half. It's about 65 and a half inches wide. And those are two reasons that I chose this over a 14 bolt, along with the fact that it's about 200 pounds lighter than a 14 bolt. From what I've read online, this is about three to 350 pounds, 35 spline axles. As you can see, I already started pulling these drum brakes because there's nothing left. It looks like somebody just ran them straight to metal on metal, but that's all right. I was planning on upgrading to disc brakes anyways. Uh, Rough Stuff has a complete kit that's bolted on for a little over $300. And then I already pulled the diff cover so it could be draining. You can see some of the big parts in there. A lot larger carrier than the 9 inch. The 10 and a quarter inch ring gear. The 99 and newer Sterlings are 10 and a half inch ring gear, but most of those are interchangeable as far as I know, except for the really new stuff. Um, and the fact that the carrier is interchangeable is one of the main reasons I chose this because you can get a 2011 to 2020 e-locker for a little over $500, brand new from Ford. And I can show the part number for that in the description. 35 spline, selectable locker, just hook it up to a, a relay and pretty simple. We'll have to uh, drill a hole or something for the wiring, but as far as I know, it's a pretty straightforward swap. I just need to get brackets cut off, everything cleaned up, brakes pulled off, and pull the carrier out so we can put new gears on it and the new locker. Okay, I'm gonna pull the axle shafts so that I can pull the hubs off and then get the, the uh, backing plates for the drums off and then the axle shafts will be out so I can pull the carrier. So something I like about this axle more than the 14 bolt is there's a o-ring right here on the axle flange that actually seals up so you don't have to run a gasket or RTV. Okay, after a short delay I now have a spindle nut socket it's just a two and three quarter inch four prong with this pilot in the middle for some reason i'm not really sure why but we will try it out okay so this one is left hand thread which is the driver's side hub God, this thing is nasty. So there's the inner part of the seal that presses onto the housing. The other part of the seal is still in the hub. Okay, hubs and seals are off. Should be able to unbolt the backing 
plates, take those off. I love this little stubby impact. In case anybody's shopping for one, the little Milwaukee stubby. Fantastic. It's filthy. Okay, next side. Hubs and drums are off. Pull the carrier and start cutting brackets off. I'm actually going to stamp those caps before I take them off. Now I can keep the caps oriented correctly and we go back together. Here's a little fun fact for you guys. I just got over the coronavirus and I can't smell this gear oil at all. I've still haven't uh, recovered my sense of smell so I'm actually a little bit thankful that I can't smell this right now. Pry bar. Probably another pry bar. And it's heavy. Well, so far things are looking pretty decent in here. We need to get the pinion out and then cut the uh, factory brackets off. Okay, the pinion nut is one and an eighth inch. No problem for the little Milwaukee stubby. All right, so I got the pinion out and then everything's ready to go get cleaned up so I can try to pull the bearings off and salvage them. So far they look pretty good. Uh, now that the yoke's off the pinion, I need to try to get the bolts out of it that somebody cut off and left in there and they seem to be pretty stuck. So plan is just weld some nuts on to the small portions that are left over and then hopefully they'll come right out in theory. Okay, wasn't too bad. All three came out. Clean this up now and move on to the next thing. Okay, we got the axle housing mounted up in the in the mill, so we can do a few light test passes and make sure it'll stay put. So I guess I didn't really explain why I have this in the mill and shaving it down. So this is actually the bottom of the axle. It's flipped upside down right now, and uh, I'm shaving off probably at least uh, an inch to maybe an inch and a half of material. And then I'll be installing the Ballistic Fab Shave Kit, which is supposed to add an additional one inch of ground clearance. So this is set at a six degree angle because that's the way they have their plate design. Um, so it'll be flat when the axles um, mounted in the, in the vehicle. So uh, I've got a long ways to go and this will be a slow process. So. thousand years later you can see I'm starting to break through to the inside here by the time I'm done this will all be opened up and then we can uh, weld the new plate on Cut that chunk out, hopefully save myself a little mill time. Here's what it looks like currently with the chunk I just cut out. So I would stay, say I still have probably close to an inch to go. When I get a little further, I can hold the cover up and, and check it.
Well, we still got a lot left. Probably about three quarters of an inch. We'll keep going. sitting here instructing us what to do. Are you done yet? No. <clears throat> well, the machining's all done. We pressure washed it and getting it warmed up for some welding. Trying to get the whole housing hot and then we can use a torch right around where we're gonna weld. Oh man. Just weld it. No, no pressure. Yeah, old batteries and better flashlight. Oh, Joyce. Hi. Waving it around everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Those aren't rated for welding, just let them know. <laughs> I figured it would at least help. Far out, man! <laughs> this is way better than staring at it to a piece of eyeball. Your face is going to be all sunburnt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Catch paper. a tan, man. Effing sandpaper. Uh, it's got to be under four, but over two, right? Over 250. Over 250. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Cool. So at least it's holding heat. Apply for Wells Fargo. <laughs> Stacking dimes. Jeez. Oh, thank God we've got Sammy here with the puns. I feel like we're doing all right here. Yeah. Why would you jinx it? Back yeah, on wood. Right. Yeah, I don't know. We're not doing it so hot. No, it's hot. Right in this area. For sure. Not here, here, but right here. The whole time. Just all of a sudden. Club smoking. Oh God. Kamikaze! They were pretty. Yeah, you're doing good. What the hell did he do that for? He just ruined his weld. <laughs> well, the theory is we're relieving the stress from everything since it's cast, so that hopefully the welds won't crack when we're done. Gotcha. Very stressful day-to-day -day life being a rear-end weld. Better relieve the stress. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's what it is. So it has to get hammered. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a human. feelings too. Hammered welds look pretty rough. Sparkler now. How was welding that cast? It's very warm. <laughs> like three hundred degrees warm. Dang. And it looks that's, weird. That's pretty good, yeah. It's kind of sparklery. Okay, here it is all wrapped up. We'll let it cool down for, well, I guess until it's cool. Something I forgot to mention was this is the filler rod that I was using. NI55 from Blue Demon. Higher nickel content. It's what you're supposed to use when welding cast. We'll find out if it worked after it's all the way cool. Hopefully there's no cracks or anything. So I got everything put away and wrapped up and then remembered I forgot to weld the axle tubes because I've seen some people have issues with spinning the axle tubes and breaking the spot welds loose. So I wanted to put a little weld on them. I'll do top and bottom so it's even. So that might be something to think about doing while you're putting this axle together. Just a little, uh, you know, extra precaution. All right, so what I'm doing now is going to shave down the ring gear a little bit. In the instructions from Ballistic for their shave kit, it says to take uh, about an eighth inch off the radius of the 10 and a quarter ring gear so that it's brought down to about 10 inches. 
diameter. And from what I've read, uh, just a, a grinder is the easiest way since the ring gear is so hard. You can't really cut it very well with a normal cutter on the lathe. So we're just going to sit here for a while with the grinder and the lathe running. I put down a, uh, a welding blanket so I don't get a bunch of uh, grinding dust all over the lathe to try to keep it a little cleaner. So here we go. Huh. I think there's actually measuring about 10.4. Okay, ring gear is all shaved down. I actually stopped a little bit shy of 10 inches because it was taking forever. So hopefully it fits fine without hitting anything. So ring gear is all clean. Bolt holes are clean. Ring gear bolts are clean. Ready to go together on the carrier. I got the carrier bearings pressed onto the locker already. This is the 10 and a half e-locker from the 2011 and up. Super Duties just uses an electromagnet and a two wire connector. Something that people may not know um, Ford uses a lot of these bolts that have the serrations on top, and they are actually underneath the head is undercut. So these are supposed to be somewhat self locking because the head will flex and. Uh, supposedly lock the bolt in place so I'm trying to use that style of bolt where Ford did as much as possible the axle shafts use that style of bolt and the ring gears use that style of bolt so we'll keep going together I'm not really going to go into much detail on setting up the the gears and the carrier because there's lots of other videos on YouTube for that but uh, if there's any sterling Ten and a quarter specific information. I'll see if I can include that. Well, we're back on the lathe. The 10.1 inch diameter was not small enough, so we're gonna bring it down to 10 inches or maybe a little more. So this escalated quickly since it was taking forever. Went and got the nine inch grinding disc. So hopefully that'll be a little faster. Stay tuned. Next, I'm going to install the inner pinion bearing. From the factory, the pinion depth shim goes underneath the, the bearing on the pinion. The shim kit that I ordered from East Coast Gear Supply, the shims actually go underneath the bearing race in the housing. I think that's because it's probably a little easier to get the race out of the housing than it is to get this bearing off the pinion make the pinion depth adjustments. I'm going to reuse the factory pinion bearing because it looks like it's in decent shape and it's like $55 for a new one which is pretty outrageous for a single bearing. A lot of what I was reading online is the original pinion depth shim from the factory is usually right around 30 thousandths. Sure enough this one's about 29 thousandths. So I'll probably start with a 30,000 shim underneath the race in the housing. But first I'm gonna get the bearing pressed on. Okay, here's what I have to press the inner pinion bearing on. Uh, I've got this piece of tube that I have found that fits the inner race of the bearing, but it also slips over the the diameter on the pinion where the bearing press is on. And then I'll back that up with a, just an old bearing race to support it a little better. Uh, I put a little oil on the pinion so that the bearing doesn't try to seize up when it's pressing on. And then I'll just use this Harbor Freight 20 ton press. Okay, there we go, on to the next thing. Here's a little test fit of the carrier with the shaved ring gear. 
there's really no room but it turns and then I was looking at the options of what I want to do for the electrical connection uh, the factory 2011 e-locker housing has a boss that comes off the side with a board hole for this connector to bolt in from the side and then this wire would feed over oh, I got it stuck would feed over that way but it's pretty much against the inner wall right now and is really not a good fit either there or going up isn't really either so i was really hoping to be able to use this double-ended connector that the factory ten and a half uses with the e-locker but i might have to just go a little less uh fancy route i guess and maybe just use a a cable gland cut this connector off and run the wire through it okay so now i need to knock the uh, inner pinion bearing out so i can add the shim behind the race hopefully this isn't too bad the notches cut out on the back side of, in the housing so you can get a, a punch on the back side of the race I hate getting old. There it is. I may make a tool to go on the back side of this race to grab it and use it a puller of some sort if I need to pull this back out. Okay, after cleaning that up a little bit, after getting that race out, I was noticing that there's some dings on the side where the punch must have been hitting because of the angle that I was having to hit it at so probably go through and buff that a little bit make sure it's smooth so just something to watch out for when you guys are doing this at home all right so I have a 20 thousandths and a 10 thousandths shim to match the 30 thousandths shim we took out under the pin bearing so that should fit right underneath this race uh, I'm just using this round chunk of aluminum that I had in the scrap that uh, is just smaller than that outer diameter of that race so it'll be able to push it all the way back down into the bore all right so i decided i'm not going to use the factory e-locker connector since it was bulky and wasn't going to fit well so i got this little cable gland. So this part will thread into the housing and seal with an o-ring and then the wires will run through here and there's a little rubber seal in here that clamps down as you tighten the nut. So I'm going to just put that right there on the housing. So I need a drill and tap for that. it's time to put the ring gear bolts in uh, I didn't really show how I got the ring gear on but um, I just put the ring gear in the oven for a little bit until it was around 200 degrees and then it dropped right on and it was easy to line the bolts up and um, I've done 
the whole try to get it started with bolts and pull it on and I'm not really a fan of that it was just way easy to get it heated up in the oven and drop it right on so that's what I would recommend uh, I've got some Loctite 272 here uh, pretty permanent Loctite so make sure the threads in the ring gear are clean and the bolts themselves and then Get them tightened down to the spec. All right, the carrier is in for a first check. Um, using this case spreader from a friend of mine, Justin Braun. You can hit him up on YouTube, see some of what he's up to. Um, Right now I'm right about 13 thousandths backlash. Uh, I think I want to be around 10 thousandths, so I'll pull it back apart and add some shims to this side and then check it again. One other trick that might be helpful you guys is I bought an extra pinion nut and then ground down the end of it past where it's crimped um, and I just did that so that I'm not wearing down the threads on the pinion every time I take the nut on and off. And then when I go together for the final time, I'll use a brand new pinion nut. All right, I just changed carrier shims around and it uh, looks to be right around 10 and a half or 11 thousandths backlash. So I might, uh, I'll probably try checking the pattern now. Um, I don't have a crush sleeve or the crush sleeve eliminator in there right now. I just have um, the two bearings on the pinion and tightened up enough to to be snug. Um, another trick that might be handy for you guys since this carrier is so heavy is a couple wraps of mechanics wire through the, the carrier to help get it out along with a pry bar for making shim changes. So Hopefully that's helpful. I uh, finally got a Patterned to where I wanted, I think. Now I need to get a crush sleeve eliminator installed. Uh, I'm using a Ford 9 inch crush sleeve eliminator um, from East Coast Gear Supply. This one that you can put different shims inside of. Um, I did have to increase the chamfer on it a little bit right on this edge. So it'll sit down on the pinion flush I can show you a picture of before and after, but just noticed there was a little gap. So the the four nine inch crush sleeve eliminator does fit though on the Sterling. Okay, what are you doing? Uh, well, I just got the pinion crush sleeve eliminator shim set up where I wanted for the spec for use bearings and using this fancy- Not the supervisor's here. Oh, interruption. <laughs> Using this fancy uh, old school torqueometer to check the bearing preload on the pinion. It'll give you the reading as you're turning it. So. Pretty fancy. Yeah. Is there a certain spec that you need for that? Uh, this one, uh, I was reading six to eight inch pounds for used bearings. Okay. It's a lot more, it's like 25 or something like that for new bearings. Yeah, inch pounds. Okay. So now I just need to pull the yoke off, put the seal on, and then put the, the yoke back on and uh, the new nut. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ready? Well, things are starting to come together. Got the carrier back installed. 
hubs are on with new seals. This is the seal number in case anybody's wondering. 370047A. Spindle nuts all torqued. Uh, the spec was 55 to 65 foot pounds and then backed off either eight teeth or five teeth. Um, eight teeth for used bearings and five teeth for new bearings. So I think I'll put the axle shafts in and torque those bolts. Got them all clean. And then finally got the pickup back inside. So you can start pulling the nine inch out and get this mocked up with leaf spring perches and keep going together. I don't know if you guys remember from the beginning of the video, but the axle bolts had a lot of really ugly ones when they came out. So Autumn got me some new ones when uh, she was at the junkyard. Yep. So some some new used Ford ones that also have the same style of head on them and thank you. You're welcome. Also you guys get a sneak peek at what Autumn's working on the Z right now. Are you judging? No, I'm just giving a sneak peek. <laughs> More front end cleanup. Yeah, it's pretty gross. Okay, this is the disc brake bracket kit from Rough Stuff. I think it uses a GM three quarter ton Dana 44 caliper, like most of their kits do. And then a Van E350 rotor. Slip on rotor from the outside. And their kit comes with the bracket and calipers, the rotors, hoses, um, there's actually a, a little spacer in here that they said you may or may not use depending on which sterling you have. It looks like mine needed it. So just want to get it mocked up to make sure everything lined up right. So looks good so far. pretty much done now I uh, just got a two wire connector from the parts store and cut the Ford connector off that was really close to the locker and just ran some longer wire so that I could have the, the connector out here um, soldered the wires to the, the original two wires and then put some uh, of the adhesive shrink tube and run, ran that through the cable gland so it should be all sealed up. Cool. All right, guys, I'm gonna keep working on getting this axle put in. I think that's it for this video. Um, hopefully I'll have another video out showing everything I'm doing to get this mounted up in the Colorado. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching.